On the rocks above Dovedale, unusual plants are beginning to bloom, carpeting the crumbling limestone in waves of purple. People come from far and wide to see the Peak District's stunning display of early purple orchids. Because of the sheer amount of them that carpets and swathes many of the limestone dales, they've entered quite heavily into folklore. In Christian legend, the plants are known as Gethsemane, because the basal leaves which go around the stem of the plant are covered in small purple spots, and they're said to be the blood of Christ, because this plant grew under the cross where he was crucified, and forever since they've been stained with his memory. As well as that, they've been used as love charms. The two tubers which grow beneath the plant were ground up and made into a potion, or they could be placed under the pillow, or even put into water to see whether the outcome of a love affair would be favourable or not. As well as that, these tuber roots were also ground up to make a drink called salak, which in the 18th century was literally worth its weight in gold. A favoured restorative, thankfully, it is no longer used as this orchid is now a protected species. The Latin for orchid is Orcus, and this name echoes an ancient legend. In Greek mythology, Orcus was the son of a nymph and a satyr. While deep in the forest he came across a festival for Dionysus. The most beautiful women he had ever seen were dancing and weaving through the leaves, and a carnal desire overcame him. He attempted to make love to one of the priestesses, and it angered Dionysus so much that she sent wild beasts to tear him apart limb from limb. His grieving father prayed to the gods to restore him, but they refused and turned him into a flower. As we know, the orchid's sexual connotations have continued until the modern day. The orchids are not a recent family of plants. The very first land plants appeared some 500 million years ago, with orchids evolving around 100 million years ago in the late Cretaceous, when the last of the great dinosaurs were roaming the earth. Unlike many other plants, orchid seeds are very, very small, on average only 0.1 to 0.25 millimetres long. This means they carry very little food reserves to the developing embryo. As well as ideal light, moisture and warmth, the seed must come into direct contact with a mycorrhizal fungus, from which the orchid derives nutrients that it cannot make for itself. This may seem like a bad idea, but their light weight means they travel great distances on the wind, and orchids can now be found on every continent except Antarctica. The early purple orchid is one of the most common British orchids, but there are many more, elusive in their distribution and striking when found. This is the green-winged orchid. It looks similar to the early purple orchid from a distance, but up close you can instantly tell it apart by its delicately veined upper petals. The green-winged orchid is pollinated by red-tailed bumblebees. One was once found with 16 pollinias stuck to its head. The green-winged orchid is a very rare plant in the Peak District, and this small patch of free blooms high above the Viagelia is its only location. Also above the Viagelia is an exceptionally special meadow. Here, in an area smaller than many garden plots, is the largest colony of burnt-tip orchids in the whole of northern England. In fact, there are probably more burnt-tip orchids here than all the other northern England sites combined. These tiny flowers are overshadowed by even the stunted grasses and grow to only a few centimetres in height. They appear for just a few weeks in mid-May, quickly desiccating in the spring sun. The burnt orchid may be easy to miss, but other spring orchids are as striking as they are bizarre. This is the fly orchid, and it mimics small female flies. The males mistake the black velvet bloom with its iridescent purple splash and attempt to mate. Then carrying the pollen from plant to plant, they thereby aid fertilisation. It has recently been found that as well as mimicking an insect, the fly orchid also secretes sex pheromones that act as an irresistible lure to male digger wasps.
These orchids all love the thin soils of the higher limestones, the toxic minerals within retarding the growth of the vigorous grasses and allowing these rare beauties to bloom. Unfortunately, the Peak District has lost five of its resident orchid species. These losses echo the national loss to British orchid species and is commonly attributed to two factors. The major cause of recent losses is habitat change and destruction, and back in the 19th century picking and collecting was a serious concern. One Peak District orchid picked to extinction was the Lady's Slipper Orchid. It grew beneath the shaded limestone screes on the heights of Abraham in Matlock Bath, but by the late 1800s had been picked to oblivion. But its extinction did not just take place in the Peak District. In 1888, eminent botanists expressed concern over its national status, having disappeared from many other limestone screes in northern England. But it was too late, and by 1917 the species was declared extinct. By some miracle, in 1930, a single native flower was discovered in a secret wood near Grassington in Wharfdale. Each year, it was protected day and night by dedicated botanists. But in 1950, disaster happened. A collector sneaked onto the site. He cut the orchid in half, taking one tuber and leaving the other in the ground. Everyone worried that that was it for the orchid, but amazingly, the next year, the plant recovered and flowered. Now, with the help of the incredible Kew Garden, seeds from the flower have been propagated and reintroduced to a dozen of its former sites. I was lucky in 2014 when I managed to find out the location of the original site. I have disguised its location here, but you can see here, on a craggy slope, the original Lady Slipper Orchid, surrounded by its genetically identical siblings and protected from thieves and hungry animals inside the metal cage. It can take something away seeing the poor plant locked up like this, but I've also been lucky enough to see it elsewhere, at a secretly reintroduced location in another Yorkshire Dales woodland. Here the colony is allowed to grow to full height without boundary. Hopefully the Q programme will continue to be successful and more people may get chance to see this amazing flower in the wild. Not all plants are as easy to find as bluebells or even early purple orchids. To a true botanist, it's the rarities that really get them going. I first started researching the country and the Peak District's rare plants over a decade ago, and since then my travels have taken me the length and breadth of the country and the Peak District searching for the real rarities. Most of my time has been spent here, in the Wye Valley, searching the high woodlands and cliffs for some of the most unusual plants that we have in the area. Although many of these plants may look easy to get to, in fact many are inaccessible and rarely visited. The valley sides of the Wye are home to a variety of rich habitats which make them fantastic for botanical hunting. Whenever you go walking in the Wye Valley and start to ascend above the tree line, you're guaranteed two things. Number one, you're already likely to be exhausted by that point, but number two, that the scenery that opens around you is some of the most beautiful in England. On the high screes in this ancient beech forest is a very unusual plant. Completely pink, it has no green whatsoever, for it does not photosynthesize and so needs no chlorophyll. Instead, it is a parasite, feeding off the nutrition provided by the fungi that have associations with the beech trees and other plants underneath the surface. It's called the bird's nest orchid, named after its tangled root mass that is often exposed above the surface. Extremely rare, it's confined to only three woods in the Peak District, two in Derbyshire and one in Staffordshire. The bird's nest orchid can grow up to 50 centimetres in height and its stem is so sturdy it can remain standing for over 12 months. The plant itself takes almost a decade to reach maturity and so can be greatly affected by picking or increased foot traffic. Its fragility is illustrated by its internal pollen masses which are so fragile that even a light wind can displace them, and so sometimes the flowers set seed without even opening.
on the wooded slopes, it's not just orchids that can be found. A kaleidoscope of colours appear from all manner of wildflowers. Who goes softly by my window? Who comes lightly in the night air? Is it friend or is it other? Who comes here with ne'er a care? Shall I rise or shall I slumber? If he knocks upon my The Wye Valley is immense and it takes a long time to explore it all. Not just that, many plants are so small they go unnoticed. But one thing to look for if you're looking for the rarities is to look for a change in the environment. Here in Woodale we are surrounded by the characteristic limestone which of course makes up the majority of the Derbyshire and Staffordshire dales. But looking behind me you will see an outcropping of dark rock. This is in fact an ancient lava flow. And whereas the limestone is incredibly nutrient rich, this rock is very nutrient poor and harbors on it a very unusual plant, a plant that could even be classed as carnivorous. This strange and alien looking plant is called butterwort. The bright green star of leaves attracts in insects with a sticky nectary substance, but once they land they are doomed, and the plant secretes digestive enzymes and begins to ingest all of the nutrients contained within the insect. When it does decide to flower, it makes sure that it puts up the bloom quite high up, so as the insects that land to feed from it are not going to fall below and become trapped, then no other plants will become pollinated by it. The name Butterwort may seem quite strange, but it links back to old mythology, for the plant is meant to be magical. In the past, the leaves were ground up to get the juices from within them, and they were spread over a cow's udder. It was believed that it protected the milk against evil spells. I'm for shady hollow. I'm this beautiful for purple that flower is rarely seen, but it's not just plants that don't always catch the eye, and in the frantic days of spring, many other creatures may go unnoticed. Along with plants, animals and birds are also reproducing and bringing life back to the land. Let's have a look at some of the species you can see with their young in early spring. Here, in a small dry stone wall near the village of Coulton in the Manifold Valley, a pair of robins are feeding their chicks.
The robin is without a doubt the best known of all British birds and a regular visitor to our gardens. Keep a lookout after you've dug up the soil. Earthworms are one of their favourite snacks. They are a very short-lived species, three quarters of all birds not lasting past a year. These chicks have only recently hatched and after two weeks of constant feeding they'll be ready to fledge. I did not stay too long. Robins are fiercely territorial and will fight the death over their chicks. These blue tits have chosen a much more unusual location for their nest, in the top of this old footpath sign. Inside the nest is a small cup made by the females out of moss, feathers and spiders webs. The blue tit is much fonder of insects than the robin. This one has been lucky and spotted a caterpillar which will make a good meal for his chicks. Indeed blue tits usually time their young to coincide with the abundance of spring caterpillars. Also hastily building their nests are the wood ants. With their distinctive black and red striped body they are Britain's biggest ants. Wood ants' nests can be up to a metre high and provide protection from both the weather and predators. They also provide a stable environment to rear eggs and pupae. The queens can live for 15 years, but the males and workers are much shorter lived, not lasting out the year. Wood ants live in colonies of up to half a million, but here in the Peak District they rarely number more than 100,000. All of the ants you can see here are workers, and all are female, though they do not reproduce. They maintain the nest for the queen and her brood. The small numbers of males are within the nest and their sole purpose is to mate with the queen. Worker ants spend much of their time collecting food and they radiate out from the nest in long lines. As well as their pincer-like mandibles, they can also shoot formic acid from their bodies, so don't get too close if you spot a nest in the wild. In the crook of this old tree, a tawny owl has made its nest and the young bird, only weeks old, is peering out inquisitively as the world passes by. Tawny owls are one of Britain's commonest owls, and at a push will even nest in urban gardens. It used to be viewed as a bird of ill omen, its nocturnal shrieks fought to foretell death to those who heard. It was the doleful cry of an owl that Shakespeare had pierced the ear of Lady Macbeth at the time of the murder. It was the owl that shrieked, the fatal bellman which gave sternest good night. Tawny owls were once heavily targeted by gamekeepers, being regarded as major predators of pheasant poults. Fortunately, such persecution has virtually ceased. Today Mum is out hunting for small mammals. The youngster spends most of its time sleeping and soon drifts away and sinks into the recesses of the bark. But not all young birds are so small. This is Macclesfield Forest Heronry. The striking appearance of the long and spindly grey heron makes the great species to observe. Usually a solitary male is spotted motionless by the water, waiting to strike at a fish with its dagger-like bill. Anglers once believed heron's feet gave off a scent that attracted fish, and often carried one to bring them luck, whilst fishing lines were covered with heron extracts to act as a lure. It's difficult to imagine now, but the heron was once a regular dish on the medieval banqueting table. Viewing the birds in the heronry is an altogether noisier and more active occasion. Heronries are occupied over many generations and are a place where the solitary birds can gather in large numbers. They arrive in February and often lay their eggs in the same nest each year, all having hatched by April, a good time to observe just before the tree leaves cover them up. Herons are creatures of habit, often mating for life. The heronry offers protection for their young away from predators, though not from each other. The chicks quickly grow and soon start to assert their dominance over each other, often in very violent ways. The beautiful red fox, with its long, white-tipped, bushy tail, is an iconic wild animal. 
although mostly nocturnal, they can be spotted during the day. I glimpse this male amongst the grasses of a small marsh near to Longston in Staffordshire. They are often solitary animals, except during the winter breeding season when they court and mate. Their high-pitched shrieking calls are often heard cutting through the frosted night air. Although they look quite big from a distance, the average male is usually no more than 75 centimetres from head to tail, and weighs little more than 5 kilograms. They mainly eat small rodents, such as voles and rabbits, although they will also scavenge. They are extremely resourceful, and across the world have adapted to survive in some extremely harsh environmental conditions. Unlike us, they do not chew their food. They use their canine teeth to shear their meat into manageable chunks. This vixen is out at dusk, standing next to her earth, which she would have dug out during the dark winter months. She did not have a litter this year, but living for up to 10 years, she still has time to breed. A fox's range can vary anywhere up to 2,000 hectares. There's a fox on the run over yon green field With the brush, that's the envy of the huntsman He's the lord of the foxes, the beast of the chase In the soft green pastures of England He can run like the wind over ditch, over dale He can fool any hunter to chase him But he doesn't have the fear of the man or the dog And he knows that there's no one will take him so it's Reynard the fox goes a-roaming alone Through the woods and the forests of England And they better take care all the geese and the hens For it'll take but a moment to eat them Well, one fine day came a huntsman bold Who had boasted with pride he could take him And he rode out alone in the light of the dawn Before even the birds had awakened This huntsman's name was a red feather John By the plume that he wore in his bonnet And he'd never been known to have failed In his task of the hunt or the killing of foxes So it's Reynard the fox goes a-roaming alone Through the woods and the forests of England and they better take care of the geese and the hens For it'll take but a moment to eat them Well he rode for an hour in search of his prey Till his eye caught the glimpse of a fox tail And he buried his heels in his horse's side He bowed through his teeth that he would not fail He rode and he rode over the chow with tail Like a madman possessed of a fury But for Reynard the fox had the better of him And he grinned through his teeth at his folly So it's Reynard the fox goes a-roaming alone Through the woods and the forests of England and they better take care of the geese and the hens For it'll take but a moment to eat them Newborn foxes are born blind and deaf, remaining that way for roughly two weeks and developing into a recognisably immature adult by around eight weeks. Only at this point will they leave their den. These cubs are just a few months old and will remain with their mother until late September when the family group breaks up and the cubs disperse to claim their own territory. These cubs, filmed by myself over ten years ago, keep rushing over to their mother excitedly in an effort to beg for food. They hold their bodies low to the ground, wag their tails rapidly and nuzzle their mother's mouth. In a few weeks, they will be foraging for themselves. A gruesome act we do not have to witness is cannibalism by the juveniles. Around 20% of cubs die underground, often as a result of fights, and they are then consumed by their litter mates. The red fox has had a lasting impact upon our law too. One of the most notable representations is that of Reynard the fox, hero of a series of medieval European tales in which he was used to satirise contemporary society. He was a cunning and sympathetic hero, though sly and immoral, and these traits still characterise the fox in our literature today. And Reynard the fox stands high on the hill With his head held up high as the victor And he looks down so sly on old red feather John Who's a walking home as the loser But although he's beaten red feather John Reynard has run such a long, long, long way And up there on the hill He's laid down his head 
And he's died from the chase of the long day. So it's Reynard the fox goes a roaming alone as a ghost in the forest of England. And they better take care of the geese and the hens for the tape at a moment to eat them. More elusive than foxes, but undoubtedly with just as strong a presence in our vision of the countryside, is the badger. Its name derives from the old French bacheur, meaning digger, and indeed the strong front legs and physique allow them to construct complex series of underground burrows, called sets. Badgers are incredibly clean creatures. They construct special latrines on the edge of their territory to avoid defecating underground. An active badger set is instantly recognisable by the piles of old hay dragged outside to prevent a build-up of fleas. Each set is occupied by a family group of badgers, typically numbering around six. After being born, cubs usually take around two to three months to emerge, and another month before they begin hunting for themselves. These playful cubs are between three to four months old and seem desperate to get above the ground. It may not be dark yet, but they are full of energy, bouncing and leapfrogging over each other. Despite the parents' obvious objections, they seem unable to accept that they are nocturnal creatures. Along with eating insects, seeds and fruits, they also enjoy bluebell bulbs. Earthworms are a staple source of protein. The average badger consumes roughly 160 in a night. They don't have to dig too much, as earthworms tend to appear on the surface in large numbers after dusk. Badgers will also eat larger prey, such as voles and rabbits. In some cases they have been observed digging out rabbit burrows. Although their eyesight is poor, they have a powerful sense of smell, around 800 times more powerful than our own. The males are called boars and the females sows, both taking just over a year to reach maturity. Here they have found a perfect home, away from nearby paths with good tree cover, a variety of fruit-bearing hedgerow plants with dry ground and lots of fields for hunting nearby. The number of badger deaths in England is truly shocking. Along with misguided cullings and the attempt to control TB, around 50,000 badgers are killed each year in road accidents. But it's not just the lives of badgers that enchant the eye. Nothing delights me more in the springtime than the sight of the first butterfly. Over their short lives, their fleeting glimpses brighten our days. John Keats wrote, Those little bright-eyed things that float about the air on azure wing. He saw their innocent wandering as a joyful reminder of our own childhood. Three hundred years ago, a famous British naturalist wrote, You ask what use are butterflies. I reply, to adorn the world, to delight the eye, and to brighten the countryside like so many golden jewels. Butterflies mean so much to us, and many people, such as me, consider them to be the most beautiful creatures on earth. Their change from plump earthbound caterpillar to wing beauty is nothing short of miraculous. The metamorphosis, involving the complete rearrangement of their cells, has a huge symbolic power. Change is possible. Poets had long celebrated beauties of the natural world, but Darwin revolutionised scientific thought about it. And with a sudden addition of time and money, amateur botanists, entomologists and bird watchers sprang up like wildflowers to study the wonders of creation for themselves. The Victorians had a love affair with nature, thanks mostly to the Industrial Revolution, which gave middle-class society the leisure time to develop hobbies. In the late Victorian era, when the study of butterflies really began, men took to the meadows with their nets and glass bottles. They saw the search as a route to spiritual and intellectual enlightenment. Today, our study of these magical insects has led to a startling discovery. Three quarters of all our butterflies are in decline, and many species exist on a knife edge. The pressures of development and intensive agriculture have been too great and sadly butterflies are one of the most notable creatures to suffer. Without the wide open tracks of countryside that used to exist, they cannot travel, and in amongst endless seas of monotonous green grass, they have become isolated in pockets, 
too small to survive in the long term. The Peak District's most endangered butterfly is found in just one small island on the edge of the Cheshire Plain. Known as the small, pearl-bordered fritillary, this beautiful orange and brown butterfly was once much more widespread, but now it is confined to this small patch of acidic marshland. At this last bastion, its yearly numbers can be counted on one hand, and it seems inevitable that someday soon they will disappear into the heavens. Butterflies are members of the insect order Lepidoptera, but they make up only a small fraction of the species, around 16 number in the British Isles, with a further 2,500 species made up of moths. The only distinguishing feature of a butterfly not present in a moth is a clubbed antenna, but for all intents and purposes, they are the same. However, they have a very different place in our consciousness. Butterflies are joyful spirits, but moths unsettle us with their ghostly appearance in the nighttime world. To see them, you have to venture out with a special moth trap, such as my easily transportable heath trap pictured here. The moths are attracted to the UV light. Their compound eyes means they see a dark patch at its centre, which they are drawn towards to get away from the blinding light. When they reach the trap, they tumble down to the box, where they hide underneath the light and fall asleep until morning. When the sun rises, the light is turned off, and as you pull back the lid, some of nature's most beautiful insects await you. All of these were caught in my garden in Leek, and you can chalk up a list of several hundred species in most suburban gardens. But you may be surprised to find out that over a hundred of our moths could be seen flying during the daytime, and many of them are just as colourful as butterflies. These moths are flittering around the vegetation by the side of the River Dove, a perfectly tranquil location for observing many species of insect. Miles away from the dove, and over a thousand feet higher up, are the moors of the roaches. Feeding on the dense bilberry, in just a few spots, you can find this bizarre species. It is a longhorn moth, so named for its enormous antenna, five times its body length. They have the longest antenna of all British moths, which more than overshadow their tiny bodies, usually no more than a centimetre in length. In their small groups, they dance in the sunlight, Rising up no more than 60 centimetres, they then drop back down to rest. This intricate dance is designed to attract females, who can be easily distinguished by their smaller antennae. And what is it best to do if you want to help to conserve these beautiful insects? Well, remember that every moth and butterfly was once a hungry caterpillar, and flowers mean nothing to them. Turn a patch of your garden wild, allow the nettles and tall grasses to thrive, and your springtime sky will be filled with much more joy. 
Butterflies and moths are living spirits of wonder, and the Peak District would be a poorer place without them. The 21st of June is the time of the summer solstice. The light shines for the longest and the cold nights are withdrawn to their slightest. Sun wheels were used to celebrate midsummer in some parts of ancient Britain. A wheel or big straw bale was lit on fire and rode down a hill into a river. It was believed that if the fire went out before the wheel hit the water, a good crop was guaranteed for the season ahead. Other fires would be lit, setting the watch, to banish evil from the land and their remnants carried around for protection and fruitfulness. Flower garlands would also be fashioned, bringing the beauty of the sun indoors. Around the summer solstice, the petals from some of Derbyshire's most beautiful and thankfully common wildflowers are used in an ancient folk custom which attracts people from across the country, well dressing. Wooden frames are constructed and covered with clay mixed with water and salt. A design, often religious, is sketched on paper, traced onto the clay, then filled with natural materials. Not only petals, but seed, cones, stones, mosses, and each village having its own special technique. Reputedly originating in 1349 in the village of Tissington, it appears to have continued intermittently over the centuries there until the present day. Mainly for the tourist trade, it was then taken up by numerous other villages in the area during the Victorian folk revival at the end of the 19th century. This is Worm Hill's well dressing from 2015, intricately designed around the village well to remember those soldiers who gave their lives during the Great War. The original purpose of well dressing is up for conjecture. Some today believe it could date back to Roman water worship, or even have pagan origins. But historically, the most popular story is that it was a rite of thanks for water purity during the Black Death. The people of Tissington believe that due to the cleanliness of their drinking waters, that most horrific of diseases was spared from their community. Other villages, however, were not so lucky.